Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And there is a huge scoop in the Sun newspaper today. I don't know if you've seen it. This is massive. Um, I'll read you the first paragraph of their page three lead. Comedy legends the Chuckle Brothers do not get on as well as they used to, the Sun can reveal. <sighs> Call me now, 0345 973 How do you react to this astonishing news published in the nation's greatest and um, biggest selling newspaper on a day that the fractures in Brexit have become absolutely unignorable, uh, on a day where Donald Trump seems likely to enact potential nuclear escalation by reneging on a deal with Iran shortly before he seeks to sign a deal with North Korea, because nothing says, trust me, like pulling out of the last deal your country signed with a potential nuclear power. The sun's gone in big on this, and uh, who can blame them? Comedy legends the Chuckle Brothers do not get on as well as they used to. The sun can reveal. I think we should all pack up and go home. Now, I was next going to talk to you about grandparents' visiting rights, but we've had a fairly bleak morning together, haven't we? I've got to, I did, this is my challenge now. Either I have to sort of join the ranks of the rest of this uh, so-called mainstream media and start blowing smoke at you and fibbing to you and pretending everything's fine or that if it is going wrong, it's all because of immigration and single mothers. Or um, we have to find a way of carrying on covering the truth together and, and digging behind the headlines in search of the facts without sort of suffering from, a, from, from mass depression. I don't know how we're going to do it. This is my challenge for 2018 and beyond. I might just pack it all in and see if I can get myself a quiz show on Channel 5. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? Imagine that. You know, sometimes they record like three or four of those in a day, so you could literally do a week's work in an afternoon and then take the rest of the time off. I only ever think like that when the sun's out. Never think like that during winter. When the sun's out, you say, wouldn't it be nice if you could just do nothing all day, every day? It'd be lovely. I mention that because we're not going to talk about grandparents being denied access to their children. I want you to send me emails about that to james at lbc.co.uk and I will read them and then we'll talk about it tomorrow, OK? I want to find out a little bit more about it. It seems heartbreaking. It would usually be dads, won't it? Parents of children split up. Dad sort of perhaps shirks his responsibilities or, or is prevented from fully fulfilling his responsibilities but dad's mum and dad have a little baby grandchild or, or a grandchild who's not a baby who they've known for years been a big part of their lives but the relationship of the parents breaks down and the grandparents end up paying the greatest price of all and the grandchildren i would argue but that is something i, I i'm going to possibly return to tomorrow because i want next to talk about the rather splendid irish author marion keys I, I don't know if you if you know her work she writes quite quite beautifully she's also written very poignantly about herself um and revealed all sorts of problems and and, and struggles in her younger years and and um problems with suicide that she's uh, uh, contemplation of of suicide that she has herself talked about suffering at the age of 46 during what she described as a midlife crisis. We had a little bit of fun with the notion of the female midlife crisis during Mystery Hour on Thursday. There's nothing funny about what Marion Keyes has discussed. But she does today argue that it is wrong to, dis to, to portray men who are having a midlife crisis as foolish, as idiots, you know? Um, I, I find this really interesting, actually, because I am a man. <laughs> I hope that doesn't come as a major shock to anybody listening to the programme. What's the next line of the Culture Club? I am a man. I am a man. No, never mind. Uh, I am a man of an age where I should now be contemplating or, or at least possibly having a midlife crisis. And that would normally involve running off with a younger woman, which just isn't going to happen to me, but what other things manifest a midlife crisis? Sort of sports cars? I don't know. Marion Key says today, there are a lot of books written about midlife crises, and they're almost always ones where the man is portrayed as a complete fool who's just totally lost it. He's a ridiculous character. He runs off with a 19-year-old who obviously has no interest in him other than his money, and he buys a car he's far too old for. They're always presented as figures to mock. And I'm afraid I've been guilty of mocking them. I, 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 we can all, off the top of our heads, probably think of someone we know. Uh, particular, I'm, I'm thinking of men now who have dropped the ball with regard to their responsibilities and their wives 
and run off um, in the desperate hope of recapturing a youth that wasn't even that impressive the first time round. One of the funniest things that men do. It's just great. It's why don't you listen to the programme, isn't it? So you can find out what men talk about in private. One of the funniest things that married men do, if they have a single friend who is still, as we used to say, playing the field. I've got one friend who still plays the field. He's far too old for it now, but, you know, old habits and that. And some of my other friends will say to him, oh, those were the days. Those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. When we were out, you know, had a girl in every port. And I occasionally have to tap these lads on the shoulder and say, mate, I knew you when you were single. You went for three and a half years without kissing a girl in the early 1990s. Where, where, where is this mythical past that you were a kind of cross between Joey Tribbiani and Casanova? I go, what, what are you talking about, the good old days? Seriously, I, I remember when you actually vomited at the thought of ringing up a girl to ask her out for dinner. There were no good old days, you silly old sausage. What are you banging on about? And they're kind of the lads who have done quite well in life. And in their mid-40s, they're actually a much more marketable proposition than they were in their mid-20s. And they're the ones, I think, whose head could be turned by a younger colleague or by a, by a well-turned sports car. And I do find them ridiculous. But when Marion Keyes writes that nobody really goes through a midlife crisis without experiencing real despair, real fear, and real soul-searching about what you have done with your life, I, I feel a little bit guilty. I think I might have misjudged these men quite horribly. But I don't know, because I haven't had one. I told you that turning 46 had hit me strangely in a way that other ages hadn't. You'd have thought turning 40 or waiting for the big 5-0 would be big. I think it's because of football. I think because football is half-time, somehow I'm subconsciously programmed now to think that I'm playing in the second half. I'd be lucky to live to 90, but somehow that, that's full-time in my mind, in my subconscious. So 46 has hit me hard, and, and, and by that I don't expect you to sort of have a whip round to uh, uh, buy me a bath chair or anything like that, but, but I do I hesitate to say this to people who are considerably younger than me, because you're still labouring under the illusion that you're immortal, aren't you? Somewhere inside you find the idea of death impossible to contemplate. Turning 46 has kind of sucked some of the joy out of life for me at the moment. I'm hoping it'll be re-injected again, and I couldn't say with any confidence how much of it was turning 46 and how much of it was watching 52% of the country vote to smash themselves over the head with a frying pan. But there's, there's a sense that, you know, there's less joy in things when you realise it's all going to end one day. I can't quite believe that I chose this subject because I thought it would be more cheerful than the last two. So I, over, I decided to talk about midlife crisis for men instead of talking about grandparents who can't access their grandchildren because I thought it would be more cheerful. And now I'm talking about the knowledge of death sucks the joy out of life once you reach the age of... Let's, OK, let's go down a slightly different path on this. I reckon recognize and respect Marion Keyes' comments with regard to a midlife crisis, but I still, and forgive me for this if it's insensitive, I still think they are mostly a bit ridiculous. I think that this curious new movement, I don't know how much experience you've had of it, of, of men trying to cast themselves as the the victims of feminism, men are oppressed. Some weird Twitter thread this weekend by some American bozo where he was talking about how men have to hide in the garage because they're not allowed in their own homes, homes that they own by their wives. This narrative, and it's particularly popular, I have to tell you, if you don't spend much time in the darker corners of the internet, you won't know about this. It's really gathering pace, this idea that, that men are victims of social change and that now... You kind of have women cracking the whip, a bit like a kind of uh, feminism Enoch Powell type ideology, that women are now have the whip hand. And men really, really believe it. Its worst manifestation is in these so-called involuntary celibates who have incredibly complicated and, and quite heartbreaking attitudes to women, born of the fact that they've never been able to kiss one. 12.13 is the time. Um, have you had a midlife crisis? And is it rather more serious? than the rest of us realise. It's not just about running off with your secretary. It's, it's about something deeper. But you are also welcome to tell me about the midlife crisis that a man in your life went through and tell me why you do still believe that he's an arrogant, selfish 
divot who frankly you wasted the best years of your life on and if it wasn't for the fact that you've got wonderful children you'd rue the day you ever met him so i'll take both sides of this particular coin 0345 6060973 i don't know why my kind of intimations of mortality haven't gone down the conventional route i think it's because i just don't laugh at me we celebrated our wedding anniversary on saturday after 18 years i just i just love my wife so much it's stupid even after all these years so the idea that i'd jeopardize any of that even if i was feeling depressed or mortal or any of that i just i just just i don't think it could happen i really don't but that's just me i, I, I might do other stuff am i going to go out and buy a stupid car i don't know i just don't know what is a midlife crisis? 0345 6060 Have you had one? 0345 6060 And finally, and this is really important, are we wrong to laugh at men going through this? Or do they actually deserve it? That's the crucial question, and that's a question you can answer regardless of, of where you are in this story. You may have no personal connection with it whatsoever, but you know someone who's been through it, and you think he is a complete... Wally. It's coming up to quarter past 12. You will get through. My apologies if you were waiting to talk about money and houses and, and the generational divide. That is something that I, I can tell you now. It's going to be one of our uh, hardy perennials in the coming months and years. That will be a subject that replaces some of the subjects that have fallen by the wayside as something of urgent importance to the country. So don't worry, you'll get another chance to talk to me. But I want to talk about midlife crises now, particularly for men, and whether or not it is fair to mock. I sort of have... 40% of me now thinks it is fair to mock. 60% of me is looking at what Marion Keyes says. But, of course, 100% of me is waiting for you to tell me the stories I'll need to reach a conclusion that's a little more reliable. It's 12.15. Where we were supposed to be having a cheerful conversation about midlife crises and a suggestion by the rather brilliant Irish author um, Marion Keyes that we should take them a little bit more seriously. But I tried so hard to take them seriously that things ended up getting very, very depressing. And now I want to steer them back to the light-hearted territory on which I thought we'd be able to conduct this conversation. So, tell me about your midlife crisis, 03456060973, or perhaps more amusingly, potentially, tell me about the midlife crisis of a man in your life, OK? And, and you will get through. I've got phone lines free, which doesn't happen very often. So if you've been waiting for an opportunity to ring in and this fits the bill, I don't see any prospect here of a ding-dong or a scrap, so this could be a lovely opportunity to break your proverbial duck. Nick is in Exeter. Nick, what's going on? Yeah, hi, uh, James. First time caller. Nice to talk to you. Likewise. You're uh, welcome. Um, I believe it's the, re the real reason for this is it's not so much a midlife crisis, but a midlife career crisis. Go on. In the fact, you get to a point in your life where you say, yeah, and you have all your aspirations when you're younger, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to say, run a big company or make lots of money. And you realise at some point, around your 40s, whatever, that this is it. This is probably the pinnacle of what you're going to achieve and as far as you're going to go. And basically, it just takes a little while to realise that what's really important in life is friends and family. And mm. that's what really counts. And then you get over it. Some people don't. And Are you talking from say, experience, Nick? Yes, Fair. I am. That, that's how, that, I went through that Good for you. a bit early. At 40, and and but some people don't, and those are the ones that end up being bitter all their life and searching for something and not satisfied. But once you realise that you know this is who I am, I'm happy with myself. Yes. When you get over it. Mm, I don't. I don't want to turn this into a therapy session for either of us. But actually, that that makes sense to me, in a way that I hadn't realised during the introduction. Because I, I, I wasn't a midlife crisis as such, but when I lost my dad, I had that kind of existential contemplation and, and thought, OK, um, you, you, you've got to teach yourself to be happy with what you've got. That's what, that's what you're saying, isn't it? It is, it is. And, and sometimes, you know, we all have these aspirations when we're younger um, and, and, and there becomes a point where you recognise, actually, this is, a, this is who I am. Uh, yeah, can I, I'll tell you something that you won't have thought of, and, and it's going to make me sound quite uh, conceited, but it isn't. I'm not being conceited, I promise you. I just, I just want to, because you've been very honest with me, so I want to tell you something that you might not have thought of before. Because for me, in the last two or three years, all of the things that I perhaps wished would have happened have happened career-wise. Everything's gone absolutely nuts. And it, it doesn't bring the joy that you think it's going to bring because of 
the recognition that you've gone through in, in recognising what's important. If it had happened 10 years ago, you know, the, the, you know, the TV offers and the book deals and all the other crud, if that had happened 10 years ago, I, I think I'd have been an idiot. But because I'd already been through what you described when it started happening, I'd re reconciled myself to it never happening, it's oddly unfulfilled. It's, well, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but it's not as exciting as you think it is when you think it's never going to happen. There we go. That makes sense, doesn't it? True, true. But also, uh, when you get to a certain age, you realise that, you know, time is running out. Yeah. I mean, I know you were talking earlier about the fact that, you know, you, you're at half time. For me, I'm a little bit further on. Yes. Um, and I'm thinking, well, I might only have 20 years. And yeah. when you've got 20 years, you think, oh, my goodness, you know, <laughs> I need to spend it wisely. Very much so. And, and I wonder also how much depends on what you did in your youth. So if you really did, I hate to use this phrase, but if you really did sow your wild oats in your youth, then when you hit 45, you're not looking back thinking, oh, I wish I'd done more of this or more of that. So there'll be, there'll be variables everywhere, won't there? The word, the word, but ultimately, it's it's being comfortable in your skin. I hate to coin that phrase, but no, I like it. Really it. Is. I like, yeah, I think you're right. And and if you're not comfortable in your skin, it's highly unlikely that running off with Dirty Gertie from number thirty, who's half your age, is is going to sort of deliver the kind of satisfaction and fulfilment that you crave. Oof! Thank you, mate. Uh, that was really interesting to me. Richard is in Lewis in East Sussex. Richard, what do you think? Um, I'm not sure if I'm middle-aged quite yet, and I'm not sure if I'm in crisis, but... Um, <laughs> but you thought you'd ring in anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I've reached 43, and um, I've started to do some things that I haven't done for a while. So You've I've reached, what, 43? 43. Yeah, mate, that's, for, um, that's peak midlife crisis territory. What have you been up to? So, um, I, rather than having um, um, an estate car, I've um, my kids have obviously got slightly older. I'm feeling not so skin. I've gone back to having a, a, a more fancy car, which is something I used to do before I had children, which is something I've been really enjoying. Yes. That's fine. Uh, I mean, it's not like a kind of silly car, is it? You haven't gone for a vintage Capri or something like that. No, no, no. It's quite sensible. But <laughs> significantly more fancy than the one I was driving, All which right. is nice. I yeah. spent more money. Um Track myself up with a bit of finance, as you do. Okay. Um, I've, um, Sporting-wise, I've realised that the sport I like being cycling, I've probably, if I'm going to really have an attack at um, doing some good cycling, I should do that now before I get much older because I'm only going to get slower as I get older. Yes. And the other thing I did that, um, <laughs> that I've always wanted, I bought some cowboy boots. <laughs> To describe them to me. Describe the cowboy crisis. boots to Because I had cowboy boots when I was 18, so I'm not going to laugh at you. They're well, not crocodile skin or anything like that. They're what? just brown with square thumb. Have you got spurs? No. The kids well, at school used to buy spurs. They actually used to walk around jangling. No, they've they got leather straps on them, but no bits of metal. And um, are, you, are you still with the mother of your children? Yeah. What does she think of the cowboy boots? Well, she's been making me go to um, the country music festival and see country stars, so... Oh, OK, she's so she quite likes it. A little bit of role play. A little yeah. bit of role play, Hank. So there's three things that I didn't do a but year that, ago. But that, that is... That, yeah, but that's healthy. I mean, if, you know, the, the, you're just describing, really, having a little bit more spending power and a little less... I don't know what the word would be. Why did you never buy cowboy boots before? Well, I never was going to country gigs to wear them. Really? There I, you go. I look like an, an idiot in my cowboy boots wearing them and normal. But I've got, I've got over that, and now I'm quite happy to wear jeans with cowboy boots. Not tucked in, obviously. No. Not like Batman. No, not yet. I like it. I, I, this is, I, th I think that you are describing behaviours that are linked to your age and your sense of ageing, but they're not in any way, to my ear, remotely unhealthy. So we've got another challenge now at 25 after 12 to work out when... Uh, midlife behaviour changes actually aren't crisis. That's kind of why you rang in, isn't it? Yeah. So I haven't run off with my secretary or any of my workmates. So uh, barring that, is everything else OK? It sounds like it to me, mate. That doesn't sound like a yeah. crisis at all, but it does sound like midlife-inspired behaviour, as, as you kind of realised. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. In college, well, FCA is having some sort of crisis. He, 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 he insists, can't you just... Be a man having an enjoyable time. Why do you have to call it a crisis? It's a social construction applied by others to define the behaviour of a man who has the freedom to behave in a way that is outside of the ageing family man stereotype. An older man dating young women and having a wild time seems quite attractive. Uh, yeah, it depends on the chronology, though, doesn't it? it? It depends on whether you've let down your wife 
and betrayed your marriage vows in order to fulfil some fantasy that you couldn't fulfil when you were younger. And if you've got a few quid, I suppose there's never any shortage of people who will help you to fulfil that fantasy until the money runs out. Um, are we going? I thought we'd just been in Exeter. Is this a different resident of Exeter? Jonathan, oh crikey, yeah, it must, they must have us on the side of a bus in Exeter at the moment. I'm getting loads of calls from there. Jonathan, what would you like to say? I just wanted to say, really, that um, I'm a dad of two young kids. Yeah. I had a very glamorous lifestyle as a sort of, I guess, a pop star. I hit a few number one hits and stuff. And I'm um, still skint, though, from it. But um, <laughs> I, I've just found that I've got the most amazing girl. I love her so much. We're not married, but we've been together 15 years. And what happens is, due to being battered by debts and surviving in lunch, paying full rent and all the rest of it, it's kind of knocked all the... Um, the, the what, what's the word the sexual drive between us and we've been sort of very much dry for about three years of just not loving each other tons but being worn out by trying to survive in yes. London and dealing with kids and now at 50 you know I do very glamorous gigs as far I won't tell you what they are but I do Why not? very major brands well I do every major brand from Facebook to Google to what band Facebook were you in names. what band are you in uh, no, no, but the band's are relevant. I did the Kevin and Perry movie, Go Large. Okay. But now I build photo sets for a very big brand, like oh, okay. X Factor ITV. And that's it. So we tick along. We're very skint. I went bankrupt last month. We're surviving. <laughs> it's very difficult to survive in London. But I'm it is. romantic. What I'm saying is I'm battling on with my wife. We love each other to bits. But the midlife crisis is we're worn out. We've had like three years of just a dryness yeah. and generally trying to deal with investigations or debts or this and that. Oh, mate, you've had a right old time of it. I, I, I no, mean, no, no. I'm, I'm very positive. I can Jen. tell that. I love your show. You're I very kind. I get such strength from you oh, bless talking you. about these world issues. We have nothing to complain about. But we find it difficult. And trying to find love again at this midlife crisis is really hard because when you've had a sexless period of so long, it's very difficult. I, I feel for you. But I don't know if that's a midlife... I mean, that's a midlife crisis of sorts, but it, I don't know if it's the conventional sort of midlife crisis. It does just sound as if you're... Forgive my French. It just sounds as if you're knackered, mate. Yes, I know, but I still... Come on, James. I still fantasise about bits and bobs. Steady on. It's, uh, I, of course you do, but I, I, you, I think of it as a lull. I could run off with some beautiful Japanese girl. I went to Japan recently to work and... What, you know, what's I'm happened not, to my radio? What's no happened? Girl. Yes. Well, you can't... Ah, OK, I get it. Yes. And, uh, well, what well, you've done I is... I just want the pressure. No, I understand. But you're looking at through the lens of your love. You're very lucky, as you just uh, began the call by stating. So, so I, but again, I... If, if, if I'd been abandoned by my husband, who was having a midlife crisis, then knowing that it wouldn't have happened if he'd loved me more wouldn't be much comfort. But I think I'm probably a bit like you, albeit um, not in every detail. It's coming up to half past 12. Um, I don't know why no one has taken up my offer to talk about the brilliant scoop in the sun today. Um, all the calls so far are about midlife crises. You seem to be... I don't know. Obviously, the rules of journalism have changed since I was on a newspaper. The page three of the best-selling... Newspaper in the country contains this astonishing revelation. Comedy legends the Chuckle Brothers do not get on as well as they used to, the sun can reveal. Um, there is room on the switchboard for you to respond to this portentous and indeed apocalyptic news. 12.34 is the time. We're speaking about midlife crises and um, it's been a really lovely conversation. A, a, a very unexpected as well, some of the contributions, in, in an absolutely lovely way. Because there's no such thing as a typical midlife crisis, oddly, although we haven't heard from anyone who's been through what we could describe as the typical one when you run off with a much much younger woman male midlife crisis specifically you run off with a much much younger woman um if you're straight or i suppose a much much younger man if you're gay did i don't know about gay midlife crises actually I, not something that's ever beeped on my radar but this notion that we have um i, I don't know treated them too lightly mocked them laughed at them when in fact what you're seeing is a fear of death really or a manifestation of failure, a fear of failure. The idea that you're never going to do those things. You suddenly realise. It's like that line in Withnail and I. There comes a point in every actor's life. I'm going to misquote it slightly, but it's when you realise you will never play the Dane. And it, it's true. If you, if, you, if, you, I mean, if you're a mad actor, if you just love it, love it, love it, love it, and you're a bloke, you, you presume at some point you're going to play Hamlet, and then you reach, what, 30? 40 probably, maybe a bit old, but anyway, you realise you're never going to play Hamlet. 
So to extrapolate from that, I think most life lessons can be extrapolated from the film Withnell and I, actually. Get in the back of the van! You extrapolate from that everybody, whatever they've done in life, and it might not be linked to your job, you suddenly realize, well, I'm never actually going to play in golf for Kidderminster the Harriers. I'm never, whatever happens now in my life, I'm never going to, you can always have some even surreal light at the end of the tunnel for much of your younger years. And then you sort of reach the point where you go, well, I'm never going to be a, I, I, I'm never going to, that dream is never going to come true. It's now become an impossibility rather than a dream. A dream at least could come true, but that is never going to happen now. I'm never going to be mates with so-and-so, or I'm never going to meet, do you see? And once you begin to absorb that, possibly the dissatisfaction that you feel prompts some of these slightly eccentric behaviours, and that means they possibly they do. In the context of obviously measuring how much hurt and harm they've done to others, that's the line, of course, between midlife behaviour that isn't a crisis. It's to do with the amount of pain it causes others. Maybe we do need to be a bit more sympathetic. I don't know. Um, William is in Harringay. William, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Really enjoyed the show. How are you doing? I'm all good, mate. What's on your mind? Yeah, it's just um, I was listening to your show and the the current content really um, really interested me because I feel society should be less judgmental and more compassionate to anyone they know going through you know what could be regarded as a midlife crisis or a difficult period. D um, depending on how much hurt they've or harm they've done to others, you know, if you if you've abandoned your kids and and left them wondering where you are for six months, you're not going to get a huge amount of sympathy from from some people but but you're right there will things will generally be more complicated than uh than the external the quick glance suggests yeah well, i agree with you you know if someone's so now they you know want to, they want to judge their own journeys uh, but i'm talking kind of more generally try not to judge what people are going through because personally what happened to you in, i don't want to go into too much detail but early in my 30s i just realized that um i've been putting too much focus on career and external gratification and i see a lot of my own friends and acquaintances doing that and um it set me on a path of thinking about the whole subject and doing a lot of uh, reading and research and, and thought and you know joining various groups that kind of i guess had a, a different perspective on life compared to the you know the traditional perspective we have um and it made me think well People going through midlife crisis or going through a hard time, there's, you know, I'm not surprised because literally from the age of, I don't know what age kids go to school nowadays, but from a young age, we're facing exams in school, we're going to university, there's pressure to get jobs, there's pressure to save deposits, which yes. nowadays for young people is, for a lot of people, most impossible as we're, you know, hearing before. Mm -hmm. Then you then you get married, there's expectation from, from parents to have kids, get married, have houses, and all these things, when there's not much time in all that for people to really think about themselves and what they want, what makes them happy. And I'd say for anyone going through a hard time, ask themselves the question, what makes you happy? Mm -hmm. What completes your world? And start going down that path of thinking. Because maybe you've reached a point where you're unhappy because these external factors, career, homes, marriage, kids, whatever, haven't completed you. Because they're not what really make you tick, or they're not what really make you happy. And um, are you happier saying, now? Are you happier as a result of your explorations? Um, it's a complicated thing, but my answer would be a hundred percent. Yeah, it it kind of completely. I was very fortunate. I started my own business very young, and it. You know, I'm not wealthy, but I'm comfortable, and I yes. spent six months really. I said, right, I put I put ten years into my career, nothing into me. So I took six months out. And went on this obviously, you know, peer of... And it did, uh, it did. You, you, I mean, you're right to recognise that that was a luxury that not everybody could enjoy, but you did sort of clear your head. You do, you do feel better as a result of these explorations. 100%. Than... 100%. Good. Life's very different. You start becoming more compassionate, more understanding, trying to look at life from different people, from different perspectives. Um, I went from being very politically right-wing, probably yes. through my family, to being kind of like very liberal and thinking, OK, well... Everyone's got on their own path. Yeah, that's what thinking will do to you, mate. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And I think some of my family hold it against me. But anyway, just... I've, my, I like I've, it. No, I message, understand why you've my called. My message is... Um, 
just, uh, you know, I think... Give, give, be kind to yourself. Time. Be kind to yourself. Give yourself a little bit of space. I like it. And I also like the way you acknowledge that, 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 that you were... In a sense, lucky to be able to do that. Um, my mate Gary, who I haven't seen for a while, we used to have a coffee in the mornings together, um, is texted to say, the only fantasies I have at Myers, James, are about me dinner. <laughs> That's just to sort of lighten the mood slightly. Uh, and I've got some terror... I mean, this is really big news, actually. If you were going to ring me with your response to the astonishing piece of journalism in The Sun today, revealing that the Chuckle brothers don't get on as well as they used to, I have to tell you that Barry Chuckle has now denied this story. Barry Chuckle has taken to social media. He writes, don't newspapers come up with some incredible, stupid, lying stories from a reliable source, of course. Anyone who knows Paul and I knows we couldn't be closer. Brothers, mates and partners, and we've never stopped working. Utter rubbish from a most angry, um, loving big brother. And, uh, I mean, the, the, the report in The Sun points out that they sometimes sleep in different hotel rooms and... Paul, uh, the younger of the Chuckle brothers, he's 70, tweeted, Absolutely disgusting. We are two grown men who do not share a hotel bedroom. If a theatre has enough dressing rooms, of course we take one each. Why not? Does that constitute a feud? So there is something strange going on in the land of the Chuckle brothers. I will stay close to this story, although I suspect perhaps not quite as close as the sun. Sarah is in Cheam. Sarah, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Hello. Um, I was hello. I was thinking to say um, I am the child of someone who had an absolutely diabolical midlife crisis. Oh, no. uh, and, yeah. And so, basically, my mum was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Me and my brother were quite small. I was 14. Um, and he had an affair with her best friend and left all of us, basically, high and dry. He's... My mum, obviously, unfortunately, passed away when I was 16. My brother was 12. Um, he has never really taken responsibility. He's never really, he's never, like, he's basically, like, never got off, like, over it. Like, he will always claim that he, you know, is also, also a victim of yes. the whole thing. And I, you, you feel completely abandoned and you feel that your mum passed away suffering betrayal that she shouldn't have had to Oh, enjoy. yeah, like, that's the thing. Like, now I'm 33 and I've yeah. got two children and that's the thing that breaks... Like, obviously, at the time, it was awful, but I've almost found it worse since I've become a mum because I think of ha what she went through in her last couple of years. It's so sad. Yes. Um, and as far <laughs> as he's concerned, I've just... Like, you know, there's nothing, really, for me to say. Why like, do you call it a midlife crisis, though? How do we know it wouldn't have happened? Uh, Go on. This is so true. I don't know. No. And he basically, when the, you know what, hit the fan, he yeah. didn't step up. In fact, he did the opposite. He couldn't have behaved worse, you know? Oh, yeah, um, so, so, so it's a reaction to your mum's diagnosis, and, and it, it, it may have happened ten years previously or ten years later. It's not necessarily yeah. linked to his age, but it's linked to what was going on around him. Well, no, I mean, in terms of his character, from what I, no I now know, since mm. he died, through family and through her friends and stuff like that, you know, he had numerous affairs. He was not a, he was not a good husband. He wasn't a part... I wouldn't say their relationship was necessarily a partnership. Um, she absolutely adored him. Oh. And I remember her saying to me, oh, it's just... I know, it's so sad. It and is I, sad. And I remember her just... It's really sad. Who looked and after so, you and your brother then, after your mum passed away? Uh, well, he moved back in... Um, but he wasn't a presence. <laughs> I hear you. Um, so, yeah, it was quite... He moved back in, but he was still out. Um, he stayed with my mum's so-called best friend for mm. a couple of years, I think, until she sort of bled all the life insurance money dry and then she was off. Um, oh, lordy. What yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. yeah well, I bet you put quite a lot of effort into making your home happy, don't you? My home is very happy. I and know. I know. Last week, and he doesn't, even, he doesn't even know that happened. Like, he's just not a per he's not he's in and out of my life we've got a really odd relationship my partner says you're more like sort of distant friends yeah he supports my brother a lot but i think he feels guilty i think that is the one th actually i think that is the one area because my brother's had quite a lot of problems i think that's the one area of where he can't kind of really ignore what he's done i see and yes. he kind of has to prop up that so the, the, that, I mean, that guilt there is the closest he'll ever get to honesty yeah basically well you seem to have turned out all right I've got very good friends. I've had... My mum's friends are amazing. Good, you know, good family support. My partner's wonderful. His family's wonderful. Hey. But it's still, like, you know, it's still one of those things... You carry it with you. Yeah. I'll never really get over it, I no. suppose. And, and, so, and, uh, but you know what? The fact that you can say that out loud already makes you more emotionally healthy than your dad. 
You can, because yeah. you, you, you okay. recognise stuff that's bad, and and if you pretend that it isn't, or you try and screw it down and hide from it, that that's when you're storing up big problems for the future. Yeah. But I don't know if it's a midlife crisis in the context of your dad. I mean, it, it was a crisis and it was appalling behaviour. But as incorrigible FCA suggests, that, that that's not a midlife crisis. That's just a man who is a complete. And then a, a word I can't repeat on the radio. Sarah, thank you for calling. Um, it's it, it, nice to hear a female voice, actually, during the conversation about midlife crisis, because, of course, as we try to police when it is a midlife crisis as opposed to just behavioural changes brought on by age, which we all suffer from at every stage in our lives, it will be the harm that is done to others, and it will be partners and children who, who suffer suffer that harm. Uh, 12.46 is the time. Um, I've done some polling in Ireland on European Union membership. What percentage of Ireland do you think is in favour of staying in the European Union? Bearing in mind that they've had a ringside seat and a lot of the reporting in Ireland is a lot more reliable and accurate than the reporting here because so many of the reporters here or, or the newspapers here um, uh, came down on one side or the other. So genuine objectivity, actually. It's available in all the news agents on the other side of the Irish Sea, but good grief. 92% uh, remain now in Ireland. Goes up to 96 in Dublin. Absolutely incredible, except not remotely incredible at all. It kind of creates a small problem for all those people who think that the solution to the Irish border problem would be for the Republic of Ireland to leave the European Union as well. 92%. That really is the will of the people. 12.51 is the time. Back to midlife crises and similar. Um... Really interesting this, and I'm glad, I'm so grateful to everyone who's called, because I'm trying to sort of walk a tightrope between treating it with a degree of levity while acknowledging that we're only discussing it because the Irish author Marion Keyes has suggested that we treat it with too much levity. So I really was in your hands on this one, and, and, and you've, you've, you've been brilliant, so thank you. Uh, 12.51 is the time. Where are we going next? We go to Ian, who's in Binfield. Ian, what would you like to say? Hi, James. First time caller. Love the show. Very welcome. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you can definitely identify um, with what we're talking about today. Um, I had my 50th birthday um, in March, um, and very sadly, I lost my father when he was 57. Ah. Um, so sort of identifying the fact that I reached that sort of milestone and, and the fact that my dad was taken so, so, so suddenly from, uh, from, from my family. Um, so when I reached 47 10 years ago, um, yeah, I, I, I walked away from my, my job. I had a, a really good job. I headed up uh, an HR department for a local authority. Yeah. Um, and I had a great salary and a holiday, <laughs> a gold plate pension, as they would uh, describe it. Yes. Um, and I walked away from it because um, I've, I've taught martial arts my whole life and, and I've, I competed at the high level many years ago. And I kind of really thought, without being too sort of morbid about things, you know, I started to think about death quite a lot yes. um, and I kind of thought well this is not what I want to do uh, dad went you know uh, 10 years from where I was at that time at 47 and I thought that's it so I walked away from a really good job um, much to the amazement of all my colleagues yeah. <laughs> threw myself into something that I, I you know I love dearly and I've never looked back I've had three fantastic years I've I've grown my business, uh, not just in the UK, but in, in, in Europe as well. And, wow. Um, I've, yeah. And, I've, and it was a real kind of... Because I've been doing it from the other end of the telescope, haven't I? I've been saying it happens when you realise that you're never going to do these things, but you realised it was now or never. I think so. And I think that whilst, obviously, it was very, you know, sort of sad to lose my, my, my dad in that way, uh, it did give me that sort of jolt that perhaps I needed to embrace the life that I believe I should have always had. Oh. So it's, not, it's not necessarily a, a, you know, a, a bad thing. Well, certainly it wasn't for me. Uh, it made me kind of realise that I was, uh, you know, the, the right side of it. I mean, I should have done it years ago. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'll gladly admit that, you know, I should have embraced this life, you know, decades ago. That would have been the best time. Why didn't you? Thought, fear, yeah. mortgage. Um, so the path less mortgage. trodden, really. Yeah, all the sort of stuff that does, I, I think, sort of keep people in jobs that they're, you know, that they that they don't like, um, because you have all those things that, as a grown up, you have those responsibilities and, and 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 things to do. And I just sort of got to the point where I thought, well, you know, whatever happens, if I if I throw myself into it, I, I'm better off doing something that I love and embrace the life I should have always had. And I, I I did it. Did you have? I mean, did you compromise responsibilities that you had? Did you mean family-wise and stuff like that? Could did you? Were you in a position to make this decision alone? 
No, because I think that by the time I, as I say, I was only a month ago, I reached 50, but at 47, I think I was sort of young enough to do what I wanted to do, but old enough to be wise enough to realise how the world works. Uh, if, you, yeah. if you throw yourself absolutely, completely all in to something that you love, um, in my mind, it's not likely to go wrong. So, uh, no, I, I, in fact, I earn twice what I used to earn. My family's got a much better lifestyle. <laughs> Everyone's uh, a winner. Yeah. You basket. Well, <laughs> in, in my case, most certainly. I mean, I, I have to say that my, my wife was wonderful. I, when, when I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm walking away from this job, I think, aside from perhaps a few chats with my mum, uh, my wife sort of said, oh. um, you know, as long as you promise me you'll never work for someone else, as long as you live, that's fine. Really? And I gave her that promise. Yeah, I gave her that promise. And I think, actually... She was probably the only one that didn't think I was stark raving mad. Certainly, all the colleagues that I used to work with. Yeah, but it's, it's not just that they want it to. I, I mean, I'm sure they're top people, but it, there'd be a little bit of them that wants it to go wrong. I think so. I think just just be, not not because they're nasty or what's no, the German word Schadenfreuden. Or, or, no, but, absolutely not. Yeah, but I think when we look at other people, we see other people being successful and throwing themselves into something that they love. It makes perhaps other people realise that they're in an uncomfortable position, they don't like what they do, and it's easier for them to say, well, that's never going to work, or yeah. that, that, that's not going to be right. Although you're, you're very lucky to have that completely uh, complete alternative. Do you see what I mean? You knew that you loved it, you knew you were very good at it, you knew about the business potential of it. You, you could sit there, it'd be no good if you dreamt of being a rock star, would it, when you were in your 20s, to hit 47 and decide... I don't think your wife would have been quite as encouraging if you said you were going to go on the road with you know, jockstrap Jimbo in the attractions. I don't think that would have gone down quite as, quite no, as well. I would much, I'd much rather have gone and hung with the Chuckle Brothers, if I'm honest with you. But, um, <laughs> to no, me. I think, I, you know, as, as I say to the, to the kids that are in my class, you know, if you don't really know who you want to be when you're older or what you want to do with your life, go outside that door and find out. You know, we've all got to ask ourselves, what is it we want out of life? And then if you're lucky, you get to sort of midlife and realise that... Um, you got, you uh, got to change direction. You got yeah, to, you got to yeah. U-turn, really. You're travelling on the, ro the wrong path and, and you, you're, you're young enough to do something about it and you're old enough to be wise enough to make the decision. So, uh, Good for I, you. certainly from my... I've never, I've never looked back. So. What sort of martial art is it? Uh, I'm a jiu-jitsu instructor. Fantastic. Uh, I teach in the southeast. so... Um, What's yeah. the name of your company, Ian? <laughs> Bless you. Combat Academy UK Schools of the Martial Arts. Do you know why I did that? Because you didn't oh. try and shoehorn it in, you see? Oh, no. no of course not. Let's see this word, gent. My mate Luke has set up a uh, Krav Maga. He's much, much smaller um, set up than you, but it's changed his life. It's, it's put a bounce in him and a, and a kind of sense of purpose that was in danger of disappearing. 12.57 is the time. Zainab is in Guildford. Zainab, what would you like to say? Hi, um, I'm a first-time caller. You're very welcome. And uh, I love your show, so thank you for having me on. Um, I, I really just like to bring up the fact that, um, unfortunately, uh, it is my husband who has gone through a midlife crisis or still going through one. Oh, dear. Um, he is 40, 48 in a few days. And, um, yeah, it started to show up a few years ago, actually, when his mom passed away in 2016. And um, then he suffered... A heart attack from being so stressed out and then he had a car accident and obviously throughout all of these steps in life nurtured him back to health yes. and you know took care of the kids we have four kids and um yeah um, i think it was just too much for him and what's he doing now what's happening now um, right now well he is a pharmacist by okay uh training um and I think he's a businessman by heart, really. He is a person, if there's nothing in it for him, he doesn't give it anything. He doesn't give it a second chance. Just turns his face against it. Um, I'm 30 weeks pregnant right now. Unfortunately, we're going through a divorce. Oh, Lord. Um, and, yeah, well, that's no fun at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I found out I was pregnant um, a few weeks after I filed for divorce. But it goes through phases, really. Um, wh what I found out is that um, when he turned his back against family, like his initial family, his wife and his children, yeah. he had a place to go to. It was his mother. Right. Um, I think it got so bad after his mother passed away that there was no point in trying anymore. Oh. Um, You're quite sympathetic I, I, still, even though... I, I, I am sympathetic, I swear to you, because I tried to look at so many different aspects in regards to this divorce and uh, rethink it so many times because I'm a, a child of, of a divorced parent and I know the effect that it has on children, unfortunately, even in the long run. 
Yeah. And despite all of these ups and downs, I, <laughs> I try to, as much as possible to just keep on going. And you have to, as a mum, as a parent, you have to. You, you, you have no choice, and and that I think is the definition of the midlife crisis that we'd all completely missed until you came on the line, Zainab. I hope things improve. I really do. But we've been talking about it for an hour, and Zainab suddenly made me realise that midlife crisis involves one partner expanding the number of choices that they have in their life, which inevitably involves reducing the number of choices that the other partner has in her life. Zainab can't choose to walk away from her four children and the fifth on the way, whereas her husband can. And that's why it's a much more serious subject than perhaps we realised, and that's why Marion Keyes is right. And that's why I'm so grateful for your call, Zainab, and I really do wish you well. I do.